Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, so the orange boxes, the orange boxes are in fact simulated half racks, right? Each of these orange boxes has 10 little Intel nooks in it, so 10 little Intel servers. And uh, we use those to, to, to work with people who are working with physical hardware. Because uh, while we're certainly in the age of cloud and uh, everything is a shiny sort of unicorn, uh, the reality of computing across the spectrum is that you need to be able to compute across the spectrum. And the hard part of that for many people is the physical, the physical world, right? We're figuring out how to work at scale in the cloud, but how do you, how do you really bring some of that uh, operational thinking to the bare metal? Um, and so I, I, I want to do a talk today which is... Uh, um, grounded in the idea that everything that I talk about is real, it's open source, you can use it, you can see it, and if it works, I should be willing to do it live on stage. And so hopefully we'll make some of the blinking lights blink. Okay. Um, Twelve years ago, when I was uh, in Russia about to go to space, um, I had a drink with a guy who'd been to space, and he said an interesting thing. He said, look, you clearly... You, you have the same thing that all of us have. You, you really want to go. But he said, let me tell you something. In two weeks' time... When you come back, and you come back, and you hit the atmosphere at 25 times the speed of a bullet, and everything goes crazy around you, and you're racing through the atmosphere like a shooting star with your hair on fire, he said, then you'll understand why we don't just want to go to space, we want to go back to space. It is ultimately, that whole experience is ultimately just about speed, the incredible energy of speed, what it feels like to be going at that speed. So the, the, the thing I always have to remember about that story is that the, the way he said it, you know, I have to remember that 12 years ago I had hair that could be on fire. Things change very, very quickly, uh, and they change particularly quickly in, in our industry, right? So these are some of the companies that have really embraced speed. You know, what do these companies talk about? They talk about speed, the speed at which they can help their users, their customers, deliver something important, something big, or something new. Uh, and I think uh, it's sobering just how fast this meme, this speed meme, has essentially changed the discussion, the conversation around how people plan and execute technology. And speed is right at the heart of that. I mean, this is, this is a screenshot of Google's cloud platform homepage yesterday, right? Build at the speed of Google. And so I, I'm fascinated by technology generally. There are winners, there are losers, that, you know, things come and go. Um, uh, I'm interested to understand how people achieve that new way of working, right? And the perspective that we bring to this is that just about 70%, maybe two-thirds, just over two-thirds, of what happens on those public clouds is happening with Ubuntu. And partly, that's because we enable it. We spent a lot of time six, seven, eight years ago enabling that, this first flush of geeks um, into the cloud environment, making, the, clearing the decks effectively, making the op operating system friendly for them to work in that very dynamic environment, right? Um, and partly, um, it's because we then have followed their progress and understood you know, what they're doing and, and, and how they work, how they think, right? If you, if you look at a bunch of different indicators, AWS images, uh, the Azure guys will tell us Ubuntu is something like 80% of the Linux on Azure. If you look at the Docker images, Ruslan was talking about Docker and how, what, a, what a clear indicator that is of change in the dev development ecosystem. About 70% of those images are based on Ubuntu. And if you look at the OpenStack ecosystem, about 65% of that is based on Ubuntu. So this, this fast-moving world is sort of right at the center of what we're, what we're interested in. Um, if you look at some of the companies that have really embraced that, Uber, Netflix, Snapchat, most of those companies, all of these companies and many more, uh, are entirely built on Ubuntu. Netflix, for example, finished last year a move to move everything to Ubuntu. So this gives us a really interesting perspective on, on, on what it takes to move fast. And what I'm interested in here today is to sort of look at how potentially the lessons and the tools and the thinking from that fast-moving world come back to the more traditional enterprise IT world and to the hosting world. Because I think... You know, when the curve is just going north, there's a temptation to feel like the curve will always go north. 
but everything ultimately finds its balance. And we're starting to see, for example, with public cloud, a discussion about what the limits of public cloud are going to be. So Dropbox just this week announced that they had moved all of their storage back off AWS onto their private infrastructure. And that clearly signals a limit, effectively, on the, on the, on the public cloud. And I think that's very interesting. It's very interesting for the hosting industry. OK, I was going to say, can we just keep the timer going? Because it looked like it wasn't running, but it is. Um, OK, so what are the key lessons from that public cloud world, from the mega data center operators, and how do those apply back into the hosting world? How do we essentially bring some of those lessons into the hosting world to enable competition uh, in, in, a, in a very useful and real way, real way between the hosting community and the public cloud community? And I think the, the simple story here is that this is entirely about automation. You know, the incredible thing about Google is how many servers they harness with so few people, right? And that's true if you go up the app stack as well. Look at WhatsApp, how many messages they move with so few people. That ratio of people to output is what's so critical. And if you're touching things manually, you're fundamentally constrained by time and human constraints effectively, right? So automating everything in the hosting business. Um, and that's really the heart of what I want to, to, to cover today. So I want to talk about open source, emerging open source tools that are just focused on that core problem of, of automation. And I want to start with the prickly stuff, the bare metal, right? Racks and racks. Because it, it is effectively the abstraction of the hardware that, that allows the Amazons and the Googles to deliver services that appear to be sort of instantly on demand. But in fact, access to real hardware is one of the key things that the hosting community can deliver in a way that the, the public cloud community can't. So how can we square that circle? How can we connect those two dots? Everybody, I think, would be familiar with the relative experience right, of, of, of operating on the cloud and jumping onto the cloud and getting stuff done versus the physical world. But does it have to be that way? Does it have to be effectively death by a million details if you start engaging with the physical world. Now, um, we spend a lot of time on top of the cloud, effectively, looking at how people work on top of the cloud. But then we started to run into cases where people wanted that same agility on bare metal. And there's lots of times, there's lots of cases where you would want bare metal, right? Big data, uh, infrastructure as a service, there are lots of cases where you actually want to work in bare metal. And with containers, with the emergence of containers, we're starting to see ways in which you can get bare metal performance, but still get the agility of dynamic provisioning effectively that, that people have historically associated with virtual machines. So I want to start out with this piece of open source. This is something called Metal as a Service. And essentially, you can think of MAS, Metal as a Service, as a physical cloud. You know, what are the, what's the key ingredient of a cloud? It's the ability to ask for a machine on demand. Say, you know, I'd really like to have a machine right now running Windows, or I'd really like to have a machine right now running CentOS or Ubuntu, right? And the ability to do that on demand. So what would it take to deliver that same experience but with bare metal? And that's really what Maz aims to do. So, it's a physical cloud. Essentially, it's IPAM converged infrastructure. I want to just hop across. On one of these racks, I think it's this one, um, we have a MAS running. And so there's a series of nodes that have been registered. Ah, I may need to re-log in. Oh, there we go. And as part of that registration process, there's automatically a full inventory. So this is an open source tool that effectively does a full inventory of all the hardware, gives you the ability to, what have I lost? I always love a live demo. Gives me the ability to map out, for example, the file systems that I like, and then to go and either commission the hardware, so I have no idea where I am.
or just deploy an operating system. So for example, here I can just go and say, choose Ubuntu or CentOS and go and deploy it. And we should see, we should see a light coming on. That's a new server essentially being turned on, operating systems deployed from scratch. This is by far the fastest way to deploy any of the major operating systems. I'm quite proud of the fact that inside Microsoft, this tool, this open source tool, is now heavily used for doing QA uh, and continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous testing effectively of Windows at scale across many different kinds of machine from, from many different vendors, right? So um, uh, we're starting to see the idea of open source operations penetrate every, every business, every aspect of the technology industry. OK, so I can get machines on demand. I can get physical um, uh, hardware on demand. And I can get that um, provisioned automatically. This is an interesting thing to offer, essentially, as a service to users, to give them control of the physical hardware. So we see that increasingly now in the physical hosting business that people will offer a portal effectively to the physical hardware that gives instant configuration, deployment, reconfiguration, deployment of the physical hardware to their users. That's something that the public clouds have been unwilling or unable to deliver. And enabling that in the hosting infrastructure gives you um, uh, uh, a competitive edge. But it's not really about infrastructure. There's a great expression that says people don't buy servers, right? They buy answers. And the servers are merely a means to an end. They're a means to get to the answer, right? And if you look at, for example, how Google positions the Google Cloud Platform, it's not really about the virtual machines or the virtual disks or the virtual networks, right? The game has moved on to the point where now it's very much about the applications. Uh, here you can see Google talking about data, right? Data as a service, data-driven applications as a solution. And who would be better at data than Google, right? That's a very credible place from which they can compete. But if you look across the full spectrum of the major public clouds, in fact, it's a race to deliver every kind of application on demand with the same sort of cloud economics that uh, Amazon popularized for the, for the raw materials, the infrastructure. And so then the question is, how, how does the hosting industry or how does private enterprise essentially compete with that application on demand type experience, the SaaS type experience? And I think this is complicated by the fact that software itself is going through a significant transition. You know, most of us, I think, cut our teeth in the industry in a time when you could genuinely understand most of the software that people were talking about, right? Uh, we grew up in, a, in the age of the LAMP stack, right? Where you could essentially quickly understand, any smart person could quickly understand all of the pieces that everybody was talking about. Uh, and of course, software's gotten more and more complicated. The speed of innovation has accelerated particularly in the open source world, right? We've, we see more new software projects created in a year now than we saw created in a decade, right, over the course of the 90s, 10, 15 years ago. And there's a natural sort of belief that smart people can just work their way through that, right? That this is just more of the same. We can deal with this because it's just more of the same. But actually, there are phase changes where the approach that you've taken fails, and you, you have to step back and, and, and think about things in an entirely new way. So if you think about the big data transition, right? Round about the early 2000s, these crazy people started talking about big data, and they started saying that actually the rules that everyone was living by didn't capture the whole truth, right? And this was very controversial at the time. The data experts, who built their careers on the idea that they could structure data and then tame that data effectively, were very threatened by this idea that people would move to unstructured data. But the reality is we had to move, we had to embrace the idea of unstructured data. And those businesses that did, right, gained a significant competitive advantage. But for a while, for several years, um, 
it was, it, was a, 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 it was almost a running joke, right? When people would talk about web scale data as if that was a joke. Now it's not a joke anymore, right? It's the only way to operate at scale. Well, in a very similar way, I think we're going through a transition with software itself, right? We're going through a transition because the software that everybody needs to talk about and to deliver in order to be competitive with the major providers is increasingly complicated. And that process is not linear. It goes through phase changes. Phase changes are kind of funny. If I said you need to get 100 tons of water to Paris, right? You would really want to know if I meant water or ice or steam, right? It's all the same stuff. It's H2O. But it behaves quite differently in those different phases. So what do I mean by this in, in, in software, right? Well, it used to be software was pretty simple. Right? The pieces were pretty simple. Maybe you needed to be specialized. You know, there was value in being an Oracle DBA. Right? But at the end of the day, the whole app could be communicated pretty simply. Today, the app has been broken into many, many pieces. The microservices trend that Ruslan talked about is a very real thing inside the mega data center operators. But even just the basic infrastructure today has had its guts exposed effectively. And if you're deploying something like a container system or a machine learning system or a PaaS or OpenStack, you're dealing with this complexity in a way that you never had to deal with complexity before. And it's not just the complexity of the application, the many parts to the application now being exposed. It's the fact that these applications are not deployed across one or two or four or 10 machines, but across hundreds of machines. And the mixing and matching of which software ends up on which machines is the real architectural debate. Now, those of you who have tried and struggled with OpenStack or tried and struggled to deliver large machine learning or, or data, data, data analytics um, solutions will understand what I'm talking about here, right? It's easy to talk about those things. It's really quite difficult to deliver them. And it's really very difficult to deliver them um, at the click of your fingers, right? So how do the very big guys deal with that complexity? Well, if you look at inside Netflix, um, if you look inside Google or Facebook or Amazon, you'll find that they don't deal with software the way IT deals with software. IT still thinks, thinks, to soft, thinks, thinks of software as pieces of software that are installed on machines with configuration files, right? But at Google or at Facebook or at Amazon, software is described in a model, right? Essentially, engineers at those companies have a way to say, look, this is the result we'd like to obtain at this sort of scale. And all of the configuration stuff flows from that model, from that picture. Just like this is a picture, essentially, just like you'd see on a whiteboard. That's a model. If you can paint a model inside Google, then the machines will effectively do the work of delivering those services. So this is a trend that we saw emerging early in, this, in the days of the cloud, but we saw that it being duplicated inside many organizations as essentially proprietary software. And the interesting question was, how could we bring that knowledge effectively out as open source to other industries or to other players in the industry. Um, and so that's what something called Juju is all about. Juju is an open source application modeling system, right? It allows you to think and operate the way a Google or a Facebook or an Amazon will operate, right? But because it's open source, it allows different organizations to collaborate around the things that they want to model rather than having every organization effectively duplicate that work um, each time you're onboarding some code. So this is a simple model. This is a model of a content management system, right? So I think that's Wikimedia. Uh, you've got a database. You've got Memcache, which is sort of an accelerator key value store. And you've got HAProxy in front of all of that. All of those pieces would be familiar to people. All of those pieces would be things that people could, could deal with quite straightforwardly using traditional tools. But as those models get more complex, it gets more and more interesting to have very high level language for describing them. So this, for example, is a model using exactly the same tools 
of one of the global ride-sharing um, operations, right? So you know the ride-sharing operations like Uber. Um, this is a, a complete model of the back-end infrastructure of one of those operations, all the different pieces that they have to continuously integrate and deploy across the clouds. And so you can see, as, you, as, as, as the complexity of the story grows, the ability to have reusable parts that can be deployed automatically becomes increasingly valuable. And I want to show that um, in practice. Let's just see if I have to re-log in. Up, oh, so that machine's deployed itself. I didn't want to use all the machines because this canvas, I think, is tied up to this machine over here. So um, let me just zoom in a little bit. Um, so what should we do? I like doing big data stuff. Um, Hadoop is interesting. Um, and this is essentially a, uh, a list of open source components that have been developed by various folks in a, in a growing community. And those components are not just the software, right? So if you know Ubuntu or Red Hat, you know that we, we like to package software. Well, that's great. What these components do is they take that package software and expand to deal with the operations of that software, right? How do I install the software? That's usually easy if it's packaged, but it also is interesting if it's not packaged. How do I upgrade that software? How do I, for example, back up the database? How do I integrate that software with other pieces of software? And they essentially take all of those operational things and distill them down into open source code. So for example, here is, uh, here is a complete, this is a big data with Zeppelin, which is a, a kind of a front end to a big data deployment. Um, and I'm just going to say I want to spin that up. So we'll go and fetch all of the detailed information there. And if I commit these changes, a little bit of luck, let's start to see. What you should see is machines being commissioned. Remember, we had an empty data center effectively. Machines being commissioned. The right operating systems being deployed. So each of these components essentially declares which operating systems it needs. They may be on Windows, they may be on CentOS, they may be on Ubuntu, right? And so all the machines that are needed to put the solution in place now get, 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 get corralled. And then the applications, the application modeling will take place in Juju. So you see why it's interesting to separate out those layers. So if we have a really good layer to give machines on demand, then it doesn't matter if we use this framework on top of a cloud where we get virtual machines on, de on demand, or on top of a physical cloud like MAS where we can get physical machines on demand, or on top of, or on top of a space station <laughs> where you get whatever you want on demand, elastically, containers can be hosts for these applications as well. So, all right, so you can see these machines have now switched to a deploying state because the modeling system has said it needs those machines effectively to bring that big data into play. And once the operating systems are installed, the application pieces will, will fall into place as well. Okay. So really, this is about creating an app store type experience for everybody, for private enterprise, right? As open source, this is stuff that people can use internally for the public cloud. It's important that this stuff work in the public cloud because that's really where the DNA is. That's where the gene pool of innovation is. And we have to be able to tap that gene pool effectively. Otherwise, we're missing out on a huge amount of the innovation, but also in hosting type environments, where you have essentially a trusted relationship with a third party around your infrastructure, but you still retain, want to retain a certain amount of control and say in that infrastructure from the ground up. So this allows, for example, um, things like PaaS and containers, which as Rosalind was saying, are challenging to deploy and operate, right? To become something that across an industry can be shared. Things like big data, things like infrastructure, which again are becoming increasingly complex and difficult to deploy. It's now possible through those open source encapsulations to share the work and collaborate around the operations 
right, of that software in a way that we never used to be able to do before. But I think there's a, a deeper story, which is that there isn't going to be a single winner to the on the infrastructure front globally, right? What, when I talk to, the, to, to customers, especially the larger customers, they absolutely believe that for them the story has to be a hybrid one. So, classically, you can imagine somebody saying, all right, I've got my hosted infrastructure, and there I want to be, be able to deploy some sort of big data story because that's ultimately I want to keep, retain control of my data at rest. That's where I want my data ultimately to live. But Amazon's quite useful. I don't mind putting a PaaS front-end infrastructure there because that's really nice. It gives me a lot of elasticity. And so with a modeling system, we can model stuff on the public cloud and in a hosting environment. And then we can connect those up so that they operate as if that was one seamless infrastructure. But you can go further. You can say, Google's pretty good at the data stuff as well, so why don't I put some analytics on Google and connect that in to the big picture model? And Azure is doing an excellent job of running business applications and infrastructure. I want to be able to connect that in as well. And this is a picture that I think really resonates, right? The idea that people get to choose where they can place the workloads based on economics, based on competence, based on expertise. Some of those pieces may be SaaS. You can only get them on a particular cloud. Some of those pieces may be software that's modeled, and you could get them on any cloud. And so you'd, you'd make decisions based on data gravity, regulatory frameworks, and so on, as to where you place the, the pieces of the puzzle. OK. So hopefully that gives you some idea of, of the direction and the elevation of the thinking around the application. So now I want to come back to the core question of infrastructure, right? Because historically, people really tend to separate those things out. They talk about infrastructure and applications as if they're two completely different things. But the reality is, one man's app is another man's infrastructure, right? In a software-defined world, infrastructure is software, right? So this is how we think of OpenStack. You see we're using exactly the same modeling language to describe all of the various applications that end up delivering the REST API that is OpenStack, right? So the modeling language, as long as you, as long as you can model applications in a really rich way, you can use that modeling language to describe infrastructure which is happening kind of underneath the cloud or behind the cloud, just as easily as you can describe um, uh, applications that are running on top of the cloud. So for those of you who know OpenStack, you can imagine this is a really easy and efficient way to take the core idea of OpenStack, this topology of applications, and stretch that out to the architecture that is appropriate for a particular environment, right? This picture doesn't specify architecture. It specifies some choices. Um, in this case, um, Ceph as a storage backend and probably um, KVM as a hypervisor. But it doesn't specify the architecture. It doesn't specify the mapping of that software to the, to the actual machines. That would be something that you would do in a particular deployment based on particular requirements for that particular customer. So the importance of this, I think, is that by making complex infrastructure tractable for hosting companies to operate, we can essentially keep hosting companies and large enterprises credibly in the game of running infrastructure even as we cross that boundary, that threshold, um, into the big software era. Now, this is a picture of storage on, I think, AWS. And clearly, again, that's a curve that shows no signs of slowing down. At some stage, at some stage, we will see the natural limits of one way of doing things. But for the moment, they open the, the, the public cloud storage story is an incredible growth story. Um, what's interesting to me is if you dig into the economics of that, right, raw disk continues to be dramatically cheaper than public cloud facilities. I think there's a dogma that says no one can do it cheaper than Amazon, right? I think the real question is, 
where are the real costs? Because it's clearly not in the raw disk. If you look at these numbers, if you look at object storage, then it's slightly more comparable, right? But if you look at online block storage, EBS type storage, then there's an amazing cost difference between what Amazon charges and the raw disks. So clearly the delta is in operations. Clearly the delta is in not acquiring and, 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 and physically hosting that storage. It's in operating it, making it available, keeping it available, and so on, right? And so the key question there is, does automation effectively change that picture? So I want to show you another application model. Okay, so those machines have now deployed, and probably the big data pieces are coming up. Nope, they're up. So that, that big data solution is now deployed. From scratch, from bare metal, machines switched off through the operating system deployment, up through the application deployment. And if I wanted, I can go and scale a piece of this out. So there's a single machine doing the Yarn Master. Let's find something else. Compute Slave, that's more interesting. There's three of those. Let's go grab another two. OK, you see another two machines turn on, and that Hadoop cluster will get bigger, right? You see how operating in the model and having everything behind it just follow, follow along completely changes the operational game. Um, so I'm just going to close that out. This is a model of Ceph, and it's a model of Ceph with an analytics system essentially driving that Ceph. Ceph is a scale-out software-defined storage. These components over here, these two bottom right components, are actually handling Ceph. So again, we're using that same modeling language, Juju, to describe the components of a software-defined storage system. And a dashboard for that, which is, which is these pieces over here, which essentially, and Postgres, a database behind it, um, which essentially gives me this view over here. So that Ceph cluster isn't doing anything at the moment, but that's a nice analytics view of what that Ceph cluster is doing. If you can operate in a fully modeled fashion, it means that you can run many, many more installations for a given number of people. You can bring your economics much more into line with the economics of being Amazon, even if you aren't necessarily at the scale of Amazon. People, again, tend to think about scale as being the only thing that matters in economics. It's not really about scale, because hardware is a low margin business intrinsically. There isn't that much to be gained by buying at scale, right? But it's the operations at scale, or the automation of the operations, which is the real key. OK, so that's storage. I think storage is one of the key markets where, because of data locality, hosting companies need to succeed in order to essentially secure their place in the future. Um, I want to talk also a little bit about OpenStack. So this is, I showed you a picture of a model of OpenStack, right? That's essentially for somebody who knows what all the applications are that they want to bring together in a particular OpenStack deployment. What we found is that to go even faster, it was useful to essentially build a front end to all of that, to say, OK, can I essentially abstract out the choices that are relevant in a large OpenStack deployment down to just a few key technology choices effectively? And that's what this tool is. Now, this is a layer up still from Juju, which is that modeling language, right? So this is essentially something, a tool that's very specific to OpenStack. And it essentially says, look, I want to make a series of choices. Just check again that I'm logged in. Yeah. I want to build an OpenStack cloud. This, again, will be on one of these orange boxes. I'm going to build an OpenStack cloud. I'm going to make some choices. Because the underlying infrastructure is modeled, because we have Metal as a service, we know about every single machine. We know about every single IP address. I don't actually have to know what the IP addresses are in this infrastructure. I just need to be able to sort of essentially choose out of the model where I want to place this OpenStack. I can go and make some more choices. Um, we can use Swift for object storage, Ceph for block storage. And then I want to um, add some machines. So I'm just going to do that. 
I'm going to split that across two availability zones, and now I can go ahead and build an OpenStack cloud. OK, so what's happening? That higher level tool, based on the choices that I made, which are kind of a narrow set of choices specific to OpenStack, has built a model in Juju for a cloud that will represent those choices. And this is a pattern that um, we see emerging into, in a bunch of other industries. For example, at MWC, uh, Telefonica was showing a, an open source project called Open Mano. Mano is management and orchestration. It's one of the key um, challenges that, uh, uh, or key questions facing the telco industry as they move into a highly virtualized, highly automated sort of world. What are the tools going to look like that do that management and orchestration? And they've assembled a stack for Mano that's all open source. At the bottom of that stack is OpenStack. In the middle, effectively, is Juju. That's providing that generic modeling language. Now, Juju has no idea about being a telco or being in a telco, right? It doesn't know that an HA proxy is being used in a telco or in a bank or in another kind of uh, a, a industry. So then there's something on top of that, which is a telco industry-specific orchestrator, which essentially exposes telco industry-specific choices and decisions, and then turns those into generic modeling infrastructure. So I think as a pattern, that's something that we will see um, more widely, um, that Having a model is really useful because it allows you, allows you essentially to assemble all the pieces that you want. But you're almost certainly going to want something on top of that which can expose just the choices that for a particular industry or a particular client or a particular piece of software are relevant for the end user. Right? And then you use the generic modeling language underneath the hood because that gives you access to all the goodness that's coming from other parts of, uh, of, of the world, of the IT spectrum. OK, I'm going to close some of these out. So wrapping up, this, roughly speaking, is what the stack looks like, right? We have to deal in the real world of physical hardware. It's a competitive advantage to be able to offer physical hardware. Um, for an internal IT department, being able to be competent at scale on physical hardware is a crucial, crucial test of their relevance effectively in the cloud era. Then we have operating systems layered on top, but those are essentially neutral, right? Nobody really cares what the operating system is. People care much more about the results, the answers, the applications, right? So we have software-defined storage, software-defined network working, more generally software-defined infrastructure, PaaS and infrastructure as a service, and then on top of that, applications in something like Juju, which is a generic modeling environment. So I hope that was a useful quick tour. Everything that I showed or talked about here um, is open source. You can use all of that. You'd be joining a large community, not just the Ubuntu community, but a broader community that's doing this. In telco in particular, we see a very rapid um, movement towards this sort of automation, effectively. And telco is interesting because historically, Regional telcos didn't compete with each other globally, so there's a lot of desire to exchange ideas, exchange practices. Traditionally, you know, you could talk about vendors and their software, and so you could effectively collaborate on making decisions about which software performed best for particular use cases. But operations were essentially um, uh, custom infrastructure internally. Remember that old joke about uh, the guy in the, in the 70s who hired a bright person to write a business app for them because they heard that these computers would, would make a, a difference in their business. So the guy says, no problem, he's happy to work on it, just, just cut a check for the first month's work. And uh, so the guy writes his techie uh, a check. And a month later, he calls him up and says, how's it going? The guy says, no, no, it's going brilliantly. Just cut me a check for the next month's work. No problem. So he does that. The story goes on and on, and eventually, the, uh, the business owner sort of says to the techie, listen, just tell me what you're actually doing. To which the answer is, well, uh, I finished writing the compiler. I'm just about done with the database. And eventually, I'll get on and, and build the application, right? It was a time when it was normal for everybody to write all their software. And we came to joke about that time, 
right? Because it's so obviously inefficient. In a sense, today, most people do that with their operations. They do all of their operations from scratch in a custom kind of way. And we will come to joke about that, right, as being a very backward way of operating, right? Ultimately, if we are able to engineer a world where the best operations expertise from banks, from, def from the defense industry, from uh, the media industry, and the media industry are fantastic um, uh, 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 kind of competence because they're so relentlessly focused on the leanness of the operation. You know, someone like Netflix is paid relatively little per gigabyte of traffic that they move. So they're enormously focused on taking a piece of infrastructure and making it incredibly efficient, right? That's not a pressure that you see in the banking industry. So, so if you take something like a collaborative bit of operations expertise and you move it through a whole bunch of different industries, you get a, a fantastic piece of operational code because it reflects so many different kinds of expertise. I think if we do that, the pendulum will swing because you know there's a dark side to what Google does in that nothing enters the Google infrastructure for free, right? They have a modeling system, it's amazing. But just to take a simple piece of open source software and make it usable inside Google means somebody's got to do a whole bunch of work to enable it to be modeled in the Google modeling language. With Juju, I think we're seeing the beginnings of an open source ecosystem to allow people to collaborate on that modeling process, which means that actually small organizations will be at an advantage because that whole portfolio of apps with all of their operational expertise and integration expertise and so on will exist and they won't have to invest in anything other than the places where they want to differentiate or the places where they want to contribute because they have some particular unique expertise. Thank you very much. I hope that is helpful and useful. Um, I wanted to close as a sort of transition to the next speaker who is a, a very long-standing friend, Stuart. I had the great privilege to meet Stuart when I was uh, in, in my early 20s, and he's been a mentor and a friend throughout that time. Um, uh, I want to talk from my, my perspective very briefly about what it feels like to own a platform, to be responsible for a platform. I just want to say this. Platform security is our primary responsibility, the trustworthiness of the platform is really our one contribution to the technology world. You know, it thrills me to see Instagram or Netflix or Uber build on Ubuntu, but the reality is the only thing I bring to that is a commitment to the platform security and the evolution of the platform. So it's extremely challenging to be asked to compromise the integrity of that platform. And this is a robust conversation that Stuart and I have had over many years, and I suspect will continue. I couldn't think of a better counterpart in that debate than Stuart. When we first met, Stuart's focus was on something called the clipper chip, which was the idea that there could be a chip which had a back door in it, a key that authorities could use to access it. And that debate went in favor of the technology industry, right? The clipper chip was was defeated as an idea. But I want to tease Stuart with the idea that he did actually get his way once, which was with the TSA. Because you know those suitcases that you buy, which have the special lock which the TSA can open, which was a really brilliant idea, right? To have a special lock that the TSA could open. Until somebody printed, published online, the 3D printing schema for that key. So you may as well not have that lock on your suitcase. So in this great debate, which I think will swing back and forth, we have, I just want to remind Stuart, we have done this experiment at least once in the last five years. And uh, hopefully we'll learn from that. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm keep you this, thank you. I'm going to keep you on stage just for a moment, if I may. So. Uh because I know uh, your team are going to come up and, uh, and move a lot of equipment here. I was, I was going to ask you about uh, Stuart, who, as, as you were saying that, was sort of uh, standing up and making notes and smiling. How, how, long, have you, how long have you known him? Um, um, nearly 20 years. And I have to say, in, in that time, Stuart always manages to have the last word. So, so your, your scheduling was absolutely <laughs> perfect. I don't know how that happened. 
All right. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for being a part of this. What's what's next for everything here? What do you what do you see on the horizon for the? What are you going to be talking about at World Hosting Days in in five years' time? Well, I tell you what's super interesting to me at the moment. You know, a lot of this work was done over the last seven years, right? Cloud started seven, eight years ago. There was a particular crowd of people that was chasing it. We observed them, and we sort of distilled that as open source, right? What I'm interested in now is that that same crowd of people that kind of blazed the trail into public cloud, today, they're tinkering with tiny devices, right? Raspberry Pis, um, all sorts of tiny little gadgets. Um, this is technology being fun again for the individual rather than for large teams. And so it's a lot of, it's, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how we enable those smart devices to be secure, to be updatable, but also to be an ecosystem for software development, right? So hopefully that's interesting to, to some folks there too, and come and say hello and talk about that. I think ladies, we're all clear. And, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Shuttleworth. Thank you very much.